Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you to Professor John DeChico for the very kind introduction uh, and for giving me the opportunity to present here at the TE3 conference. It's quite an honor and pleasure to be participating in this conference amidst such a great group of distinguished academics, industry professionals, policymakers, researchers, and local and global public citizens, all interested in issues relating to transportation, economics, energy, and the environment. Thank you to all of you for coming. My name is Cynthia Lynn Lowell. I am an associate professor in the Robert Dyson Sequicentennial Chair in Environmental Energy and Resource Economics at Cornell University. The lead author on our paper is my outstanding former PhD student, Yuan Chen. Dr. Chen received her PhD in Transportation Technology and Policy from the University of California at Davis this August. She is currently a visiting fellow at Cornell University. And later this year, she'll be joining the faculty at the Shanghai University of International Business and Economics uh, as an assistant professor. It's a pleasure to be working with Dr. Yuan Chen, and our project is entitled Supply, Demand, and the Effects of Government Policy in the Chinese Automobile Market. For those of you who have not yet seen a car that's produced by a Chinese automobile company, Here's a photo of one. Uh, this car is called a GX7. It's produced by the Chinese automobile company Geely. Here, the lead author on our paper, Dr. Yuan Chen, is showing us another automobile produced by a Chinese automobile company. It's called, it's a plug-in electric hybrid. It's called the Tang, and it's produced by the Chinese automobile company BYD. China is experiencing rapid economic growth and along with it, a rapid increase in vehicle ownership. Here's, here's some photos of vehicles in Hangzhou in Zhejiang province in China. This rapid increase in vehicle ownership and vehicle usage in China is unfortunately associated with such issues such as traffic congestion, local pollution, and concerns about global climate change. In this paper, we focus on two policies that the Chinese government has implemented with regards to automobiles. The first policy is a fuel economy standard that China introduced in 2004. This fuel economy standard has a target fuel consumption level of 6.9 liters per 100 kilometers, which translates to approximately 34 miles per gallon. This fuel economy standard applies to passenger cars, SUVs and light commercial vehicles. The second policy we focus on is China's corporate average fuel consumption uh, standard. This was uh, put into effect in China in 2012. The corporate average fuel consumption standard is a target level for a firm's sales weighted average fuel consumption. So while the first policy we're talking about, the fuel economy standard, applies to individual vehicle models, the second policy, the corporate average fuel consumption standard, is much like the CAFE standards in the United States in that it allows firms to average over all the vehicle models that they produce. There are two notable features of the Chinese automobile industry. One feature is that Chinese automobile companies include both private firms as well as firms that are partially, at least partially state-owned. A second feature of the Chinese automobile industry is that some Chinese automobile companies, both private and state-owned, form joint ventures with international car companies. So in this figure, uh, we are depicting the market structure of the Chinese automobile industry. In the green boxes, we have the major Chinese automobile companies that are state-owned. In the yellow boxes, we have the major Chinese automobile companies that are private. And then in the blue boxes, we have the international car companies with which uh, Chinese automobile companies have formed international joint ventures. And these include uh, international car companies such as Honda, Ford, and Hyundai, for example. 
So object the objectives of our research are to analyze supply, demand, and the effects of government policy in the Chinese automobile market. To do so, what we do is we develop and estimate a structural econometric model of a mixed oligopolistic differentiated products market. This model allows different consumers to vary in how much they like different car characteristics on the demand side, and it allows state-owned automobile companies to have different objectives from private automobile companies on the supply side. And we estimate our model using a comprehensive data set on the sales, prices, and characteristics of the majority of vehicle makes and models in China, including alternative vehicles. So in this table, we present summary statistics of vehicle characteristics we have chosen to focus on. These characteristics are whether or not the vehicle is an alternative vehicle, whether, uh, the fuel efficiency of that vehicle, its length, its weight, its capacity as measured by the number of seats, and its horsepower. As I mentioned, one feature of our model is that we allow consumers to vary in how much they like these different car characteristics. So among the parameters we estimate in this model are parameters in the distribution of marginal utilities that consumers in the Chinese automobile market have for each of these car characteristics. In particular, we're estimating the mean marginal utility for each of these uh, car characteristics and the standard deviation of the marginal utility for these different car characteristics. One of the results we find is that the standard deviations of the marginal utilities for each of these car characteristics is statistically significant, which suggests that consumers do vary in how much they like each of, each of these car characteristics. Another feature of the model that I mentioned is that we allow state-owned firms in the Chinese automobile industry to potentially have different objectives from private firms. So private firms are maximizing profits over all the vehicle models that they produce. We allow state-owned firms to potentially care about things other than profit as well. Nevertheless, uh, although state-owned firms do care about other objectives, such as consumer surplus and alternative vehicle production, we find that their pr primary objective is to um, make profits. We also explore in our model whether Chinese automobile companies that form joint ventures with international car companies develop better technology. And our measure of technology are these technology-related vehicle characteristics, including whether the vehicle is an alternative vehicle, its fuel efficiency, and its horsepower. We find that Chinese car companies that form international joint ventures with car companies in the US and Japan have lower marginal costs of these technology-related vehicle characteristics, which suggests that they have better technology. In contrast, Chinese car companies that form international joint ventures uh, with car companies from other countries have higher marginal costs of these technology-related car characteristics. Because we find that Chinese car companies that form joint ventures with uh, international car companies from the US and Japan have lower marginal costs of technology-related characteristics and uh, potentially a measure of better technology, we decide to explore this further by looking at the individual international car companies from US and Japan, respectively, with which Chinese automobile companies have formed international joint ventures. And we find, in particular, that one of the technology-related characteristics that we examine, fuel efficiency, for fuel efficiency, we find that joint ventures with Japanese firms are associated with even lower marginal costs of fuel efficiency than joint ventures with US firms are. So even though joint ventures with US firms and Japanese firms both uh, are associated with lower marginal costs of fuel efficiency, we find that joint ventures with um, f firms from Japan have even lower marginal costs uh, associated with fuel efficiency. The opposite appears to be true for horsepower. We find that in general, with the exception of Honda, joint ventures with US firms are associated with even lower marginal costs of horsepower uh, than joint ventures uh, with Japanese firms, even though joint ventures with firms from both countries lead to lower marginal costs associated with horsepower. So these results may reflect a possible relative preference for horsepower in the US and a possible relative preference for efficiency, fuel efficiency in Japan. 
in the previous literature, Zhang et al. find uh, uh, evidence that in all industries in China, Chinese firms that form international joint ventures benefit from indirect technology transfers that enable them to, to perform better. We find in our research a more nuanced result for the Chinese automobile industry in particular, namely that whether or not Chinese automobile companies that form an international joint venture have higher or lower marginal costs depend on the headquarter country of the international car company with which the Chinese automobile company forms a joint venture. So we find that it, uh, the headquarter country of the international car company matters. And so some possible reasons uh, and sources of differences between international car companies from different countries that may explain these differences in marginal costs include possibly differences in intellectual property rights, protections, and laws in the different countries, of, um, uh, in different category countries of these international car companies. There might be differences in automobile regulations such as fuel economy standards that different international color companies from different countries might face. There might be differences in technology, differences in efficiency, or different motivations for entering the Chinese automobile market, different motivations for forming international joint ventures with Chinese automobile companies, or maybe differences in the types of vehicles produced by international car companies from different countries, possibly reflecting different distributions of consumer preferences in different countries. One exciting feature of our model of supply and demand in the Chinese automobile market is that we can use our model of supply and demand to run um, and analyze and run simulations of counterfactual scenarios. So in particular, we use our model to run counterfactual simulations to analyze the effects of two sort of types of counterfactual scenarios. In one set of scenarios, we evaluate what happens if we add a new alternative vehicle to the existing set of vehicles in the Chinese automobile market and see what happens. In another set of scenarios we uh, analyze, we try changing um, the government policy and trying alternative government policies. And for each of these scenarios, we evaluate the effect of that scenario on alternative vehicle market share, on consumer surplus, private firm profit, and state-owned firm utility. So first, let me talk about uh, the simulations where we add a new alternative vehicle. So uh, these scenarios might be of particular interest to those of you in the audience from the automobile industry. And so what do we do? So we're thinking of adding a new alternative vehicle to the existing set of alternatives, to the existing set of vehicles in the Chinese automobile market. And so the new vehicle we consider adding is one that is like an alternative vehicle that already exists in the Chinese automobile market. So it's just like the Buick E-Assist 2.4 liter hybrid. This is an alternative vehicle that's produced by a state-owned Chinese automobile company that has formed an international joint venture with General Motors. So the new vehicle we simulate looks just like the Buick E-Assist 2.4 liter hybrid, except it differs on one characteristic. So in one simulation, we add this new vehicle that's similar to the Buick E-Assist hybrid, which is already in the market, but has this new vehicle has, is 25% um, more fuel efficient. In another simulation, we try adding this vehicle, just like the Buick E-Assist 2.4 liter hybrid, but its length is 25% longer. Another one, we have the weight 25% higher, the weight 25% uh, lighter, and when we add one more seat to the vehicle, when we try horsepower 25% higher, how about what if the horsepower is 25% lower? What if the firm producing uh, this uh, hybrid is not a state-owned company forming an international joint venture, but instead a private firm that does not form joint ventures? Or maybe it's a state-owned firm that does not form joint ventures. Or maybe instead of being a state-owned firm forming a joint venture, it's a private firm forming a joint venture. So we try all these scenarios. One interesting result I wanted to highlight is that we find that the firm that's currently producing the Buick E-Assist 2.4 liter hybrid would benefit from also adding a new vehicle, um, which is just like the Buick E-Assist 2.4 liter hybrid, but has horsepower 25% higher. So if it added this additional vehicle, it actually increases its utility and its profits. So um, that's an interesting result we find that I wanted to highlight. Another set of scenarios we simulate are ones in which we uh, um, try different alternative policies. And so these set of simulations might be interesting in particular to those uh, in the audience who are interested in policy. 
We tried uh, privatizing, a policy that privatizes all the state-owned firms in the Chinese automobile industry. We find that this actually decreases firm, proper, firm profit. We also try a scenario where we ban Chinese automobile companies from forming international joint ventures. We find that this would increase alternative vehicle market share, but at the cost of increasing the mean marginal cost of alternative vehicles, and also at the cost of decreasing consumer surplus. We also try a set of simulations where we vary uh, the fuel economy standard in China. So the fuel economy standard was a standard that applies to all vehicle models. In particular, we consider scenarios where we increase uh, uh, the standard or the target under the fuel economy standard by 5 to 35 percent, making it more stringent. We find that the, an increase in the target under the fuel economy standard can lead to increases in alternative vehicle market share, consumer surplus, firm profits, and average state-owned firm utility. So it's actually possible that making this fuel economy standard more stringent can benefit consumers and firms and also increase alternative vehicle market share. The idea is that when you make a fuel economy standard more strict, it, this favors fuel efficient vehicles and lowers their relative price. This has the possibility of benefiting consumers who buy fuel efficient vehicles. It also has the possibility of benefiting consumers who can now switch to buying fuel efficient vehicles because of their lower relative price. And this um, may therefore have a possibility of also benefiting firms. And we find that this is the case uh, for the fuel economy standard in China. The other policy we were looking at uh, was the corporate average fuel consumption standard, which you may recall is the one that I said is similar to the US CAFE standards in that it allows firms to average across the vehicle models that they produce. We actually find in our simulations of the corporate average fuel consumption standard that the corporate average fuel consumption standards is inefficient. In particular, alternative vehicle market share, consumer surplus, and firm profits would all increase if we remove the corporate average fuel consumption standard. So some reasons why the corporate average fuel consumption standard is inefficient are the following. First, this corporate average fuel consumption standard does not require that each vehicle model achieve a minimum fuel efficiency, fuel efficiency target, but instead allows firms to average across all the vehicle models they produce. Another problem with the corporate average fuel consumption standard is that it imposes a compliance cost and computational cost burden to firms of having to average across all the vehicle models they produce. A third reason the corporate average fuel consumption standard is inefficient is that in China there is already a fuel economy standard in place. So the fuel economy standard applies to individual vehicle models and then adding this corporate fuel consumption standard on top of it we find is inefficient. Our result that China's corporate average fuel consumption standard is inefficient and imposes additional constraints on firms that may counteract the existing fuel economy standard is consistent with uh, results of a previous work, previous work by Bento et al, who find in the US context that if uh, a CAFE standard um, can counteract the effect of other policies such as uh, gasoline taxes in their case. Since we find that the corporate average fuel consumption standard is inefficient, we also try scenarios where we remove the corporate average fuel consumption standard and then increase the target under the fuel economy standard. And we find that the policy that yields the best outcome of all the counterfactual policies that we considered is one in which we remove the corporate average fuel consumption standard and increase the target under the fuel economy standard by 25%. We find that this leads to large increases in alternative vehicle market share, consumer surplus, average private firm profit, and average state-owned firm utility. And the idea is that since the corporate average fuel consumption standard, which allows firms to average all, over all the vehicle models they produce, we find that this is inefficient. So it turns out to be best to remove the corporate average fuel consumption standard and then make the fuel economy standard that applies to um, each vehicle model more stringent instead. So in conclusion, we find several things. First, we find that it is important to allow for consumers to vary in how much they like different car characteristics when developing a model of demand. So we find that consumers do va uh, vary in how much they like different car characteristics. We also find that state-owned firms may have different objectives uh, from private firms. 
we find that Chinese car companies that form international joint ventures with car companies in the US and Japan have lower marginal costs of technology-related vehicle characteristics um, uh, and potentially suggesting that they have better technology. We also find that China's corporate average fuel consumption standard is inefficient and that alternative vehicle market share, consumer surplus, private firm profits, and state-owned firm utility would all increase if China removed its corporate average fuel consumption standard and made its fuel economy standard more stringent instead. So our results have, uh, is, are significant for industry, government, society, academia, and NGOs. Our model is of interest to car manufacturers who wish to better target cars, particularly alternative vehicles, for the Chinese market. And our model has important implications for policymakers interested in developing incentive policies to increase market penetration of alternative vehicles. So thank you again to all of you for coming. I very much look forward to the comments from our panelists, Marian Ka and Timothy Johnson. And I also very much look forward to our ensuing discussion and any questions and comments you may have then. Thank you very much. <laughs>